Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to RT Machine Podcast. This is uh, episode two of season one. Number two. Number two. We're at it. Uh Uh, We got a great guest on today, uh, Lewis Lumber Products out of uh, Picture Rock, PA, and Keith, welcome aboard. How you doing, everybody? (laughs) You want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Keith, and uh, yeah, how sure. you got started in the wood business and uh, came to Lewis Lumber? Well, um, I'm a uh, Penn State grad in uh, wood products uh, way back in 1979 and uh, went to work at uh, Rex Lumber Company in um, out of Englishtown, New Jersey. Spent 11 years there on the road mostly traveling and calling on shops. You were in sales. <clears throat> yeah, I was in sales, mostly in Pennsylvania, some in upstate New York. Okay. Um, ha- went to school with a guy named Mark Lewis, and uh, we and his family has a sawmill, had a sawmill at the time, still does, Dwight Lewis Lumber Company up in Sullivan County, and we um, remained friends. And, and then so in 1992... Uh, uh, decided to uh, join them and start up this distribution business, which at that time was in Williamsport. Okay. And uh, so we've since moved down to um, Picture Rocks. I say down, it's probably over. Mm, yeah, right. <laughs> about 20 miles east of Williamsport. And uh, that was in uh, uh, 98. And uh, so that's where we've been ever since. So have grown quite a bit and... Uh, uh, really have settled in now. I'm, I'm probably too old to switch companies and go anywhere else anyway. So. <laughs> Stay where you're at. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That was, uh, what was in there before you? I know there was uh, the Futon Bed Factory. Was that yeah. right before you? or? Yeah, that was uh, uh, PCM, PCM Millwork made Futon yeah, Beds. right. And they were there until... Uh, 94 <clears throat> uh they they went out of business when their uh owner was killed in a plane yeah crash, he was on know. the one in pittsburgh the one right upside down. yeah charlie yeah. being tall yeah. guy yeah right him yeah before that it was um pennsylvania hardwoods that's right and then before that it was uh h&e manufacturing i didn't know that one so that h&e stands for handles and excelsior so Excelsior, most people don't know, is actually wood peelings, and uh, today there is still Excelsior. It's used to test fire retardants. Oh. Wow, That's interesting. interesting yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you buy it as a bale. It's, it's baled up. It's just real tiny shavings. Back in the day when it was uh, popular, probably we're lo- maybe talking about turn of the century to the maybe post-World War I era would have been used for packaging. Okay. Mostly with munitions. Mm. So if you would think about how um, fire unfireproof that would be on, <laughs> on a battleship, <laughs> you know, you're packaging all your... It's wood. Yeah, right, it's wood. And it also it was used to stuff mattresses. Also mm. another fire hazard, I guess. Yeah, but exactly. uh, So uh, I think when plastics became much more popular, the... The peanuts and all of those things kind of replaced Excelsior. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what that was one of the company's products, and the other ones would be handles. And so they made uh, rake handles uh, up until I think they did that until 1984. And they would, and their biggest customer was rakes for golf courses. Hmm. And uh, then that shortly they lost that market to uh, overseas products coming in. Right. Uh, they made a lot of. Uh, uh, Christmas tree poles for um, mm. fake Christmas trees, hmm. and um, I think that got replaced by the same kind Plastic. of people. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, uh, and before that, it was Burroughs Brothers Limited, and Burroughs Brothers. Um, I, I'm not quite sure of the founding time. <clears throat> I know that Mr. Burroughs and Mr. Sprout uh, settled Picture Rocks back in the 1840s. Wow. So I think that uh, somebody locally had done some research and found history that there was a Burroughs Brothers Limited making furniture, dining room and bedroom furniture, uh, right around the Civil War time frame. Hmm. And 
they operated until 1938, and that's when H&E bought them out of, I think, receivership because I think they had gone out of business be- mm. due to the Depression. But So when was that building? The, the office building is the old building, right? How, yeah. How old is that? That was put up in 1914, oh. so that's still there. And there's still a couple of other buildings. There was an old, an old dry kiln, which we use as a maintenance building now, which was an old convection kiln. Uh, that's that one brick building that's in there yet, and that's so that's still that has the date on it actually. Hmm. All the other buildings we basically have been taken down uh, since we've moved in okay. there, and um, and replaced them. the The mill was there when we moved in in 1998, and uh, that had been put in in or yeah we moved in 98. That had been put in in 1980 probably 84 or 85 the petermans put that in okay and um and that was to make to take rough lumber there was a sawmill on the property at one point in time and Going they were across taking the street across yeah, the road there right they were mm-hmm. taking uh uh logs and making lumber um and then and putting them in this convection kiln so the convection kiln would have been uh, the science behind it being that you're running hot water through pipes that were in 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 an 8 foot pit and then that heat would would come up uh, and uh, drive the water out of the the uh, wood. Hmm. Not as scientifically sound as the kilns that are today, today. obviously, <laughs> but but that would have been the start of kiln kiln processing. Okay, uh, well, prior, it's pretty interesting that they yeah yeah. Pro, I'm prior, sure they had to rotate the stock a lot more that way. Yeah, they probably would have had to rotate it. It was. Uh, it, and it was big production, so it was going in on rail car kind of uh, things. It wasn't done by hand necessarily, but it certainly would have been handled by hand. Yeah, yeah right. right. Um, the uh, prior to that time, before kiln drying, would have been people sawing mostly rift and quartered lumber because that's very stable. So today, if you see antique furniture and it happens to be quarter sawn white oak. And we think, oh, boy, those people really knew what they were doing, man. Look at that high-end white oak. Well, they were doing it because they it was the most stable way to make furniture. Okay. Um, today, people pay big dollars for That's it. That's right. Um, yeah. So it's – and it and it's quite expensive to make. Uh, it's very wasteful, actually. Mm-hmm. Much mm-hmm. easier to make plain sawn lumber. And, and the stability in kiln processes today is far greater than it used to be. Yeah, they can get away with it. Yeah. yeah. Back then, they had a lot of trees that could just waste. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rest yeah. went to firewood. That's right. That's right. Yeah. For sure. So how many employees do you have over there? We have 35. Um, we cover an area. We deliver lumber to shops in about a 250-mile radius of Williamsport. So that gets us into all of Pennsylvania, most of New York, uh, the New, uh, New York City area, a little bit out into Long Island, um, New Jersey, uh, Maryland, Delaware, uh, Northern Virginia. We'll go a little bit further south sometimes, but mm-hmm. uh, it usually takes a, 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 tra- a trailer load of material to do no, that. You, so, you we, to yeah, it's hard to, hard to do it as a distribution business, but we'll we'll do that sometimes. And and then we cover uh, a little bit of West Virginia and into Eastern Ohio too, that way. Oh, that's quite the expanded territory. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, if you look at a map um, and and uh, do this by by Department of Transportation rules, it's it's out and back in one day with a truck. That's yeah. what's legal. <laughs> yeah. so, uh-huh. It sounds like, wow, how'd you come up with that 250-mile radius? It's about as far as we can drive a truck and get it back in a day legally. So mm-hmm. that's what that's all Makes about. Sense. Yeah. Yeah, and with your central location, that gives you a nice yeah reach actually yeah it does major yeah. major territories really yeah and we're close to highway systems that helps us out a ton yeah you're not totally deadheading no no doing a fair amount of picking up lumber uh we're we're fortunate to where we are located to be able to get to major suppliers major sawmills and concentration yards in pennsylvania new york uh pick up lumber oh nice yeah, yeah very good helps us out a lot yeah exactly. we have our uh your Star salesman over there, uh, <laughs> Cody. Cody. Yep. <laughs> yep. So Cody's uh, helped us out with a couple of 
I, I guess you know more the industrial woodworking equipment. So we we've uh, we plane, we rip, we mold, chop, sand, glue, and uh, you guys have been active in quite a bit of uh, of, of all of that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, been a good partnership. Yeah, yeah, we uh, it, that that part of our business has certainly grown. We find that more and more of the wholesale kind of customers are either in positions or, or want to uh, buy lumber that's been processed to a greater degree than what it used to be. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it has to do probably with, first of all, I guess, cost of uh, doing it. And secondly, uh, uh, just lack of, of uh, technicians to be able to do it on their own. Yeah. You know, it's kind of hard to big hire problem. enough people, yeah. That's a big problem, it especially is. these days. Yeah. Yeah, so everybody's reaching out to the resources that they can right pick up and not have to do much more machining to it at that point right yeah we we have probably turned in our business uh we probably do as much on the custom side so it would be more work geared towards the architectural millwork community uh we'll do we will grind our own knives and and do a lot of that for molding work but um we have some regular customers that are make that we make parts for component parts uh, and and still send out probably a little more than half of our businesses still remains what we call lumber sales where we're selling lumber into shops that are that have their own equipment that are doing things so, so we still do quite a bit of that yeah okay here's a question for you so as time has gone on i mean you guys started 90s there Were you guys originally just selling lumber or did you kind of jump into doing the moldings and trim and everything or you just kind of gradually worked into that? Well, uh, I would say probably as an entity, we were mostly just a lumber dealer. So we were selling to people who had shop equipment. We had a small percentage of customers that we were doing some mill work for. Um, but it was a maybe less than 10% of our business at that time. Then in 98, we bought a molding company, and uh, then we've expanded that several times since then. So, um, yeah, we put the optimizing ripping system in in 2001, and we upgraded that with a color optimizing system in 2008. The scanner, yeah, the scanner yeah. in front of it. Was that, was that original Ryman new? Uh, at that no the yeah the Ryman was the Ryman was no that, that Ryman was new in ninety oh. in two thousand and one I think okay yeah but the scanner was new in two thousand and eight right. that was a Lux scan right scanner yeah I remember that. We, well we sold that for you yeah, yeah. and then uh, so then since then we've moved the uh, we've moved into that the uh, the uh, Marine Johnson five twenty four correct yeah form scanning system so we've gotten away from color scanning right. Um, because so much of the industry is not as concerned with color as mm-hmm. much as it was back in the late 90s and early 2000s. What grades do you run through the Ripsaw? All grades? or Yeah, we'll or? run all grades, but most of our business still remains in the uppers, so it's selecting betters and FAS. The scanner doesn't do you a whole lot of good, really. Uh, no, it's, it, it isn't, and that's because most of our business – they were running through that is for moldings, mm-hmm. and so people yeah, want clean. Yeah, they want clear lumber. Mm-hmm. They want they want uh, a lot of that. If we we do some chopping, and uh, but we're it's it's hard it's hard to it's hard to be profitable in that sometimes for us. Uh, you really have to be doing high volumes yeah. in the chopping business to make it work. Hmm. Um, and and so when we our business model is probably more set up on kind of a custom basis so we'll run a lot order by order and because we're sensitive to li- to delivery dates so we don't have an opportunity often to batch runs right and um so if we could batch runs and be mm, you know kind of telling customers well you'll get it when i get it <laughs> uh, which doesn't work too good that doesn't <laughs> no. work that way yeah so uh, we've kind of gotten away from that we'll still do some we do some chopping, hmm. um, not 
not what we had thought we would do when we set that up originally. We thought mm. we'd do more, but yeah. but it didn't happen. Hmm. The uh, equipment that I recall you have over there in front of the Marine Johnson, we you put in a Julen lift that we found for you used one, right? That loads the layers onto right. the conveyor, and then you have the uh, scout deck to uh, optimize or to tell the, the machine where to position the blades. Yep. What's some of the other equipment? I know you have another Marine Johnson fixed arbor little twelve inch machine. Right. There. It's kind of an older one. Right. We have we have another Jolin lift on the planer. The Yates, uh, you have the yeah, Yates yeah. So now. the the advantage of the Jolin lifts for us is that it's it's a, it saves in footprint. That's really what we were looking at them for Rather originally. Than an unscrambler. Yeah. Or right. Or yep, yep. Yeah. So uh, we didn't. We only had so much square footage to work with, and and uh, that really worked out well. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, you guys did a nice job of, I would, I guess, basically call it retrofitting that Jolin lift and yeah. and getting it reworked for us. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, that was a really good way to go for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah that worked out fine. Yeah. We, yeah. But it, you needed that certain style where it loaded lengthwise, if I remember right. Yeah, we had to load it lengthwise uh, because we wanted to bring a lift of lumber to that point. And then be able to pick it up one course at a time, and then you had to forward it, and and then that's when it hits the uh, the deck to be able to yeah. run it over the optimizers. And yeah, we got lucky to find that one. Yeah, Western PA. Yeah, uh, worked out well. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It worked out real well. And then you have uh, winding molders. I think you have a few of those over yep. there. Yeah, we have a nine inch and a twelve inch winding. HS, um, HSK. Machine yep. Train. Yep. They work out pretty well for they you. They work out really great. Uh, we're we're uh, we're real pleased with them. They they're not new machines. Uh, the uh, they they're uh, the nine inch was I think we bought that in two thousand and five and the twelve inch in two thousand seven. There's some of the original HSKs. That was yes. Early on, the right. HSK technology. Right. Yeah. 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 Often we we've, we've said now. It's easy to say this now, and we can almost joke about it, but at the time it wasn't funny. But we've been on the bleeding edge of technology mm. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that scanning technology that came out early on was, uh, was, was good to a point. And then you have to understand the limitations. Right. Yep. And uh, uh, scanning technology that was black and white works out great if you're dealing with what you recognize is only going to be seen black and white. Mm -hmm. So you have to recognize that uh, heartwood in cherry is red and heartwood in hard maple is brown. Right. So if you tell a black and white scanner <laughs> that, that that pixel range is not good, uh, it might work out great for cherry, but horrible for hard maple mm -hmm. or vice right. versa. It's come a long way. Since it has. Years. It sure has. Yeah. 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 They can big, identify, things, identify things a lot better. Yeah, big difference. Yeah. And the, the Lux scan color scanner was uh, was very effective and, and was very good. Um, the, the reason that we got away from that was uh, not because it didn't work. It did work. Uh, the challenges are that it, it just wasn't what the customer base is looking for right, right now. Right, right. So much of it is, so much of our products are painted. Uh, the, 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 uh, yes. Yeah, uh, funny, I was just in a shop this week that <clears throat> most all their exterior moldings are Sapelli. And yeah, exactly. They're, and they're priming everything. Right. So it just it was odd that, wow, here's all this great wood. And yeah, covering it up. <laughs> covering, yeah. It, yeah. covering it right up. It always makes me cringe. You go into a cabinet yeah. shop and there's beautiful cabinet made out of maple and then oh, we're gonna put it in the paint shop and put yeah. white on it <laughs> yeah <laughs> everything's getting fried. Yeah. yeah yeah big difference it's crazy how the market's changed over the years it is yeah. yeah yeah we we get uh uh little dribs and drabs that uh, maybe maybe some people are looking back into natural woods again when i say natural woods i mean not painted because right. i i don't think we'll see it go swing to nat to a, a true natural finish for colors but at least uh, they're they're doing things with some stains now and, s and showing some grains and, mm. and uh, it's like a big circle. Yeah, it's back around. Right. Yeah. 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 Cherry is a nice product for us because uh, half of our raw material uh, comes from the sawmill, Dwight Lewis lumber. Okay. And and probably thirty percent of their harvest is cherry. So oh, wow. that's unusual because nationally, I think the harvest percentage for cherry is like three percent, hmm. uh, something like that. But uh, we're up in good good cherry territory. Yeah, definitely, so, definitely. Yeah, yeah. 
What's what uh, what other, projects are you working on now? Uh, well, we are doing a lot with rift and quartered white oak um, on on some commercial custom jobs, um, and uh, and and doing a lot in walnuts. Uh, oh, yeah? So yeah, that it's these it's that's that's probably the designer choices mm-hmm. right now. Heavy mm-hmm. heavy to those two things. Um, and price wise, they're they're at the max too. They're they're uh, this quarter quarter and rift white oak is really quite hard to be securing right now, hmm. and and we're not in great great true white oak territory here. Uh, that's more of so a your mill doesn't cut that for you. Uh, no, they won't. They they get into some white oak, but um, you know, not to get scientific or anything, but <laughs> white oak is a, a family of oaks, uh, just like red oak is families of different kinds of oaks. Uh, the white oak um, is made up, the, the premier white oak is made up of the species white oak, Quercus alba. We up here don't have near the amount of alba that we do to chestnut oak, which is also commercially falls into the category of white oak. It's got tyloses. It's got those properties that, that belong to white oak. But the colors aren't as nice and the, the logs aren't as big. And, and uh, so it doesn't serve as well on some of these custom large commercial jobs that we get into where hmm. people are sensitive to sapwood and, and mineral in the, in the heart. And, yeah. uh, and certainly not in rift. We don't have anybody locally that's sawing rift or quartered. Hmm. We don't saw it. Uh, at the sawmill, so yeah. hmm. we have to go out to uh, Indiana and uh, parts of Ohio uh, to uh, Missouri to get that kind of material. You find that things are different these days, you know, where people learn more about this from the internet and the different cuts and white oaks and rift and quarter. Does that make a difference, or is it just architects and designers that learn this stuff? I mean, what what's the change? Um, I think. It's probably just a look, and if you could picture somebody going through a magazine and saying, hmm, I kind of like that. <laughs> uh, that's what veneer books are like. So if you're in an architect's office and they're starting to design something or a designer's office, they have literally a book, and it's pages of veneers showing what things look like. That doesn't always match what's out there. Um, yeah, and the book might have the best of the best. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> with, with that uh, natural beauty in it. Yeah, so <laughs> let's and, call it that. Yeah, right. right. So veneers, think of uh, people that don't understand how things like sheet goods are made, plywood is made. It's made up out of veneers. Well, they're slicing that veneer. And they are slicing and cutting and producing only the best. They don't want any defects at all. It also has to go, that log has to go through a process where it sits in a vat, a steamed chemical bath uh, that that helps to uh, uh, prepare it such that it slices properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that impacts the colors a little bit. So sometimes you'll see sheet goods that don't look quite the same color as the solids that are put on the edging around it. And we'll often get calls saying, hey, there's something wrong with the color of your wood. (laughs) What what do you mean? Well, when you go and look at it, they're comparing it to a veneer. And that's just, you can't do that. That's right. Yeah. Not the same. Yeah. So the architects, I, you know, I don't want to put them all in the same category because some are extremely knowledgeable. But some of the ones that that aren't, they, they just maybe didn't, I don't know how to word this. Maybe uh, they want to leave their own mark and uh, and it's somebody else's trouble to figure out how to make it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so. the way it works. <laughs> they just put it on your lap and you figure that's right, it out. That's right? right. And for enough money, we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why the paint industry has become so big. Uh, that's a possibility. <laughs> hey, let's take that and let's just paint it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I see you got a lot of live edge stuff as well. Yeah, we have some live live edge slabs. Uh, we call them flitches, and um, uh, which is a very different kind of product for us. 
uh, the customer is different. I'm used to selling, say, 500 board feet of lumber or 1,000 board feet of lumber, which, depending on the width and the length, might be, you know, 120 sticks of wood. Now we have to figure out how to price one piece and try to make money at that. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's challenges with it, too. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of kiln drying, Um from the aspect that you get some stability in your moisture content. But secondly, you know, it, it's important to try to kill bugs and eggs and other things that are in yeah. things. And so if sure. you can't get your temperatures up around 135 degrees or above, uh, you're not going to kill the eggs that, right. that that might be in there. So Yeah, I think a lot of people with, with this whole pallet yeah, exactly. decorating phase, they don't realize no. that they're bringing all these possible Potential. bugs and yeah. insects and yeah. things in and mold and yeah. You know, it's and it turns before you know it. They, yep. Hey, I got this bug problem. Right. Something, <laughs> something's eating my furniture, <laughs> and, and it didn't happen before I put that wall up. Over there. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's why we bought ours dried. Uh, yeah, no, there. and that, that's a that's a huge thing. You know, there's a lot of people that are buying things on on. I mean, social media is so popular today, so it's easy to buy things on marketplace and mm -hmm. and. Uh, Craigslist and other places, but you know you don't know the source of all of that, and and if people don't understand and don't know, they're not even trying to. They're not purposely doing anything wrong. They just hey, I tore a barn down and I have these right. pieces For here. Sale, yeah. yeah, next thing you know, you've got all kinds of uh, uh, beetles and and uh, chewing through it, and and you don't you know you'll see powder post beetles a a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, We've had some issues with that before because it came from some pallets. Yeah. And uh, we actually had to take all of our, I'm trying to think of what it was. It was it was probably hickory, some hickory moldings we had downstairs in the store. And, man, they were just rifling through the sapwood of that stuff. Really? Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Can, I, I don't remember how much it was lineal footage-wise. I remember the dollars of it. Pulled it out. Into the yeah. Red. yeah, we had a big. That's what we know. It's yeah, had a nice campfire in the backyard <laughs> oh, for a couple of weeks. So. Oh man! So, what is your process for this for your live edge slabs and stuff? Well, we uh, will buy them. Um, for the most part, I would call it green. They may not be green. They may be air dried or whatever. But green meaning that it's not kiln dried. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we take those products in and and uh, we'll we'll put them on sticks and uh, take them up to the kiln up at Dwight Lewis Lumber, and uh, Mark will throw them in the kiln up there and we'll 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 dry them down to six to eight percent or you know at least we try to really get it down below ten, mm -hmm. and then we bring it back into the mill and individually we'll run those boards through the planer. Uh, actually, through the Semco, through the planer sander, planer sander yeah. and um, and uh, then we, it, when we get it clean and flat, uh, we'll um, actually sometimes uh, to make it appear nice in a photograph. Uh, sometimes we've actually had to take a sponge and and wet it mm -hmm. again. Yep. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So we've we've uh, and then we try to write some dimensions on it with chalk, so that people know how wide it is or how long it Certain is. Certain points. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then once that happens, then we, we so we photograph it um, and we post them on the website. Uh, but then we also put them in the store, and and once they're in the store and they dry out, that's the way they are. They're dried out. They're dry. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. We didn't mention that you have a storefront that you. Yeah, we have a storefront for people to walk in and and uh, buy uh, you know one piece if they want one piece. We've done. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> it's basically for the walk-in trade, which. It's it's hard to have a, a lumber business up in this part of the state because everybody thinks that, you know, that, oh, okay, I'll just go to the sawmill and get the wood I need. Right, right. And uh, it really interrupts the wholesale business, so to speak. And so um, when we moved down here in 98, that, that building, uh, that first floor was a, boy, it was a plywood floor. Oh, and, yeah. yeah, and and it had there were some holes in it, <laughs> hmm. and underneath is an old stream bed in that building. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, so we had to tear all that out and and uh, put uh, bridge timbers in it and and poured a concrete floor. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. But but it gave us a space then to 
put wood. We didn't really know what we were doing. Just putting, we would take lumber carts and just throw plain lumber on it and let people come in. And um, that worked for a while. And then it became kind of a an outlet kind of thing. So like anything that was rejected in the molders would end up down there and people were always expecting to be able to buy things for next to nothing. and thought it was leftovers. Yeah. And so we've kind of gone away from that now and lay up product that's nice and uh, and on the shelf for people to come in and buy if they want to buy one piece or two pieces or whatever. Yeah. We, and we just launched the uh, an e-commerce business. Oh, did you? Yeah, it's called thehardwoodrack.com. Okay. Um, and that's a whole other way of doing business again because now we had to come up with a product line because we wanted it to be a click and buy right. kind of site, which is very different from walk in. Yeah, walk in and wholesale. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. people say, "Gosh, you got a beautiful product. Why don't you sell it online?" Well, you know, it's not it's not a sweater. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I want to buy that ship. size sweater, but I want it in the pink instead of the blue. And okay, and I take a large, and it's not that way. Every board is very different. So we've tried to come up with a product line that might fit that audience, assuming that that audience may not necessarily be professionals. Right. It's it's DIYers, you know, it's, mm-hmm. and uh, so um, to try to understand and think through what. They might want to buy. Now we're still working through that. The shipping's got to be a challenge. Yeah, we had to have Lots all of that, that all, all uh, worked out uh, to to be able to estimate the shipping and and uh, and to make sure we had to get an app in to make sure we were charging the correct sales tax. If if oh, uh, yeah. by if, ter- where they are. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, based oh. if we had Nexus or not with them, and mm-hmm. Nexus being the ability to charge sales tax or not charge sales tax. And, right. And so we to try to keep it on the legal legal uh, yeah. means there and doing everything appropriately. It's mm. it's just a very different way of doing business. Yeah, that stuff's getting to be a challenge. It is, it, you know, between states and California, you got to charge sales tax uh, for machines no matter what, uh, whether manufacturer or not manufacturer, and that's a bit of a pain. Yeah. Uh, so an interesting thing about charging sales tax is um, uh, when we have this app uh, that we have applied. It it knows their their job is to know that there's sales tax for a state, but then also within a the state, there okay. they do allow sometimes other taxing yeah, bodies, yeah, yeah. and uh, so. Uh, but in some cases, some states charge tax on something like delivery, and other states don't. Oh. And <laughs> try to try to put that information into an accounting software system yeah. that that just says, are you charging tax or not? Yes or no? Well, sometimes. That doesn't work. <laughs> mm-hmm. That'd be a nightmare. Do you have your own, uh, pro- you have your own programmer, or you have a? Uh, uh, well, we use a local uh, company that's been helping us out tremendously. Okay. Um, uh, we've we've uh, we have a couple of uh, I would say probably younger people that are inclined to work along those lines, but but boy, I'll tell you, it's it's. Mm, it's like learning Chinese for it's, it's so hard it's so hard to know everything you gotta <laughs> yeah. know about yeah, it really is. different taxes and yeah. Just like, just the whole just like even this, this podcast and uh, doing doing this kind of thing, uh social media stuff is oh, it's just a very different world. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Very, very very interesting and um and and quite the opportunities. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. For, for people that are willing to, to uh go out and try to grasp it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the big thing is, you know, getting everybody the knowledge of people like yourselves, you know, coming to the forefront more and really being able to understand for the customers what we're dealing with. You know, yeah. like a great example is just with the Live Edge. You know, you see so much of that out there right now and people are just pulling stuff out of the woods and everything. And oh, yeah. then you see so many people adding resins and everything to them. And I just cringe every time I see these videos and stuff. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. It's like. And knowing to the degree of what you're taking them through the kiln process, and that's what you really want to have, yeah. you know, to really produce a product. It's, it's one thing if you're not dealing with, but it's going to crack, you know. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I can, out of a lot of those videos you see online, it's like, man, I wonder how many of those things are <laughs> are just total garbage right now. <laughs> to, make, to make it worse, they, they put them up at high speed. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> so it looks like you did it overnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the, the e-commerce, uh, I mean, it's something that you have to embrace because the younger generation isn't wanting Absolutely. to go out as much. Sure. Touch the stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm still one of those people. I love walking through your hardwood store. Yeah. I've bought stuff from you guys. The wife gives me a project, you know, it's like, <laughs> make this for me. Yeah. And I, I love doing that, but there's a lot of people out there that Absolutely. just want to buy it sure. online. Sure. Yeah. You know, so... Well, just think, uh, you know, I, I'm whoever's even listening to this, how many times have you looked at your phone today? Oh, uh, yeah. So, like, if I sit down to try to buy something on the internet, um, up until last year, man, I was sitting at my desk with a giant desktop kind of thing clunking through. Now, uh, I know people that don't have a desktop or a computer. It's all they're, they're doing it on their smartphone. It's all in the palm of their hand. Yeah. So that, that whole power base of people moving into purchasing roles is going to be uh, changing the way people buy things. And if uh, hopefully we can learn from this, you know, that I I see the difficulty in applying it on a wholesale side, certainly, Uh, but there's got to be things that need to happen quicker so that people can be still contacting and doing business that that way. You almost, with the younger generation, you almost have to take Instagram and Facebook and uh, LinkedIn now, you know, we've been trying to put more posts up on there and mm. get, that's how you get your name out anymore. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how do you advertise? I mean, there's no, putting in a magazine doesn't really help and for our industry anyway. Yeah. So, so it's just like looking for jobs, you know, trying to find employees. Uh, the, the, the method of doing this 25 years ago is putting that in a newspaper. Wait, does anybody even yeah. read the news? Yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> they, <laughs> you know? Uh, Where do you get one of those? <laughs> yeah, never seen one. <laughs> yeah, I used to be able to start fires with it. I couldn't even do that anymore. Right? But that that's uh, that certainly has changed, and and we've all had to work our ways through that. So, how do you contact people? Well. You know, maybe through Facebook uh, or or through Instagram or or. I don't know, you know. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not that technologically advanced to understand all those things. Yeah, but, like me. Yeah, yeah but, the, but that's that what that's, that's where, what has that's to happen. Where you have to go, you have yeah. to put on all those yeah, exactly. things until you find somebody. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think one of the other things it does as well is is makes people step their game up, you know, because of instant critical comments and things that happen. So it makes you react and. You know, whatever you're doing, it's you know you have to make sure it's right the first time, and or mm-hmm. the reaction to something in the machinery business, it's something's going to break. It's yeah. just when, and it's the reaction <laughs> of getting that piece back up and running. And you know, those are the things that uh, I think make the big difference. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, we we've we've we have an advantage up in this where this local region here really of still having quite a few farms around. And we find that the kids that grow up on farms are uh, naturally inclined not to be bothered by things that break. Yep. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to fix them, but they don't get stressed out over breaking. Because they know it's going to break. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They're used to that. <laughs> yeah. So, it depends on what time of day it breaks. That's right. That's right. So I, I'm, I'm sure that that's probably going to change here too uh, with time, but, but uh, that has certainly helped us out being here to be able to tap into, uh, you know, that farm kid kind of mentality a little bit. Uh, uh, not, not that, not that it's better or, or, uh, whatever than, than kids that don't grow up on a farm. I didn't grow up on, yeah, in that area either, so well, but, but boy, I can really see it when it comes to, uh, hands-on stuff in the, in the, in the mill. Um, you're one of the few, I think that you have a maintenance guy. Yeah. Yeah. We hired a one. maintenance guy. Yeah. Yep. A lot of these are having a hard time. Yeah, um, our service company is extremely busy because people can't find anybody to fix these machines. But. No, well, we we got really fortunate. Uh, we hired uh, Dominic, and uh, you've met Dominic, yep. I think. Yeah, and uh, Dominic didn't really have a whole lot of experience, uh, but he he had. Uh, you know, his experience was he had been a crane operator. He'd done construction. He rebuilt diesel engines for trucks. Uh, he yeah, just had a mechanical. Yeah, background. just had a kind of a mechanical background and uh, didn't really have any formal training or anything. And and he's really turned out to be quite a great find. And he's a younger guy, and that's helpful. Yeah. But we were struggling for a while with uh, with help, 
And as you're saying, Ron, to try to get technicians in mm. is not cheap anymore either. Oh, no. no. And you got to pay for their travel and everything else. Right. And, and And it might be two weeks before they can get in and... You know, we can't afford to have machines down that long. So. Yeah, so I said our guys are extremely busy. And, yeah. And sometimes we try to switch things around to get them there quicker because when, when people are down, but it's right. not always easy. No, it's hard. I mean, really our hard. guys are all over the country. I yeah. Mean, one of our guys was in Tennessee this week. Wow. And, and we're sending guys to California, especially with these Oliver planers, you know. We sent mm. guys to California and Idaho and Texas and everywhere to work yeah. on them. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's uh, – it. it's – it's, I don't know if it's a lost or a missing trade thing. It's just certainly far fewer people learning that. I think you know? so. I think it's, yeah. uh, well, the mentality has always been got to go get a college education and learn how to do it with a computer, and maybe that's part of the problem. So, so. The computer part is important, too. Uh, you know, you guys are selling more and more equipment that's CNC. and Sure. Yep. Um, uh, that, that certainly... Uh, that whole concept is uh, not not that doesn't bode well with older mechanics either. Right. You no, know? that's true. So you almost need a combination. Like oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah, with new technology, you yeah. really have to. We have quite a few people that that embrace it pretty well, and mm. once they get in, you can show them the uh, the benefits of it. Yeah. You know, it, it comes on pretty good, but you still have the tough ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need you need the young guy beside them to <laughs> show them what's going on. <laughs> Well, and there's some stuff like a <clears throat> straight line rip saw, for instance. I mean, what what can right. you really do to it? Uh, <laughs> right. You yeah. can't really com- – or table saw. Right. I mean, there's, there's only so much computerization you can do to anything. Yeah. So, But when it comes to CNC routers and like your rip saw, I mean, yeah. you, you need it in order to be able to tell the blades where to go and get there accurately and all that. Yeah, and yet you still need the uh, mechanical uh, yeah. understanding of, geez, you know, my Bear. blades aren't quite as sharp right now. What's going yeah. on? My bearings are – getting overheated and I'm not really sure why. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just found out this week that we probably are over greasing that rip saw really? and, and, uh, how dangerous that is to yeah, over grease. It's, it, mm-hmm. it's not oh. good. Yeah. yeah. Over greasing is worse than, uh, under greasing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, which is something that I, you know, talk about farm mentality. Probably would have pumped more grease in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Open bear. Yeah, back then it was like. It comes out. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't care if it gets on the floor, it'll just preserve the wood more. So. Yeah, right, exactly. Yep. Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that, that kind of understanding is, is uh, needed. And that's, yeah. that's a younger kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And you guys are pretty fortunate right now. I mean, you have your son Christian involved as well there. So yep. the next generation's coming in. And I got used to over the years just meeting with a lot of people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And now I'm starting to see more of the younger generation coming into the yeah, industry. Sure. So, yeah, well, we are blessed that way. Um, uh, my son, whose background was uh, a degree in English literature from William and Mary. So, oh, okay. You know, wow. Uh, this is quite a, a yeah, change. Yeah, it is a big change. <laughs> and then he's really he's really taken to it quite well and doing a fine job for us. And uh, and it, and it's nice. It just it's a it takes a whole layer of stress off, uh, knowing that there's somebody else there that can uh, take care of things and move into things. There's still an awful lot of aspects to the business side of things that probably just are going to have to be learned. Uh, based on what happens, the compliance issues, making sure you're doing everything in accordance with OSHA regulation, mm. uh, the safety issues, uh, the insurance issues with uh, with not just being able to carry insurance, but uh, being able to make sure that you're you're offering a safe environment. But but even workers' comp um, uh, and the cost of health care is is. Oh, yeah. Really drives a lot of people yep. towards uh, trying to find solutions where you don't have to hire people necessarily, or making sure that you're right. hiring the right people. Yeah, yep. uh, that that has really changed a lot. To be able to have to talk through those issues, uh, maybe uh, uh, do a lot, do quite a bit of networking uh, with with cohorts. Sure. Um, that's that's not a that's not a young man's game necessarily. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Yeah, but certainly encourage them, but that's hard. Yeah, well, they'll have to eventually. Yeah, we'll have to come exactly. around to it. We all we all were through, went through that phase. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> I remember being in a in a in a room with two hundred guys. It seemed like that probably wasn't that many. 
Uh, and I was, you know, maybe a year out of college. And uh, and this was back in coat and tie days. Mm-hmm. So everybody yeah. in that room was looked like they all knew each other. And nobody knew me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I can remember that 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 uh, some of those guys, uh, uh, you know, they were the they were the big guys in the lumber industry back then. And, mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, so uh, most we of them used, probably used to wear those anymore. coat and ties. And oh yeah, that was uh, the way you had to do sale, business. On right? sales calls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were out. Be at a shop with sawdust everywhere. I come home with a dirty <laughs> suit coat all the time and dress pants ripped because I was crawling around dirty old machines. Yeah, and exactly. It's much different now. If you don't wear blue jeans in for a sales call, oh, I look know. at you like, yeah, right. Well, well, yeah, well, it's this guy, yeah. you know. <laughs> Mistake you for a banker or a lawyer. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It would throw me out. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's that, that part has definitely changed. You know what else has changed a lot? You guys, I'm sure, see this, but – just the fact of calling on customers on a regular basis. Yes. You know, it's not, not the same thing anymore. You used to uh, maybe try to see somebody, uh, say, uh, once a month or once every two weeks if they were a big customer. And uh, and now that person probably doesn't want to see you too often. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they uh, kind of want to see yeah. you when they want to see you, yeah. really. So. so the hard part about that is how do you develop relationships in an environment when people don't really want to see you. It's difficult. Yeah. It's difficult. I know with, you know, older guys like you and me, I mean, you'd invite me into your office anytime sure. I showed up, but uh, some of the younger guys, they just would rather just send me a text or just send me an email and you don't have to come by. All right. You know? Or they'll say, ask them if they have an appointment. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No, I don't have an appointment. <laughs> Sorry. Show I just tell them all I'm here to see the maintenance guy. <laughs> 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 and if I if it's been the third time and I still can't get in, I just come in the back door and work yeah, my way there. You go. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> well, you, so you can get away with that because you have that kind of a little bit of an inflection in your face. <laughs> I better let Some him say. in. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't come in, he might do something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Some say I have distinct markings. <laughs> 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 yeah. but it works different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it certainly is different. That that that. Uh, so we're all in this this environment where you got to try to build business in in a in a declining uh, market, so to speak. Uh, but but also because there's fewer and fewer customers out there. Oh yeah. And so you're still trying to to uh, find people that either already have relationships, or you're trying to find new ways to build relationships. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, who are you doing that with? And especially if you don't know how to use social media, All right? All right. That that those are the challenges that we're faced with, and it probably isn't just our industry either. It's no, I'm sure it's, it's all across the board. Across. I mean, we do still find that the face to face and our guys. Well, let's face it, in our business. Yes, yeah. have a challenge. Absolutely. Need, how do I make this? Yeah, I'm going to get on the phone and say, Cody, can you come over here and look at this right. thing? I mean, I'm not even uh, sure what I'm asking for, but can you do this? I need, or, I, can I you need find to, somebody who knows yeah, how to do this? So that, that part helps us. And yeah. then, of course, our used equipment, we can always say, you got a, you got a bone yard that I can go look at, and that'll get us out into the plant. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. So, so uh, you know, in your case, it's a, you have a clientele that, that maybe that works for. Right. Uh, that, yep. that, that's who you are, and that's what you're choosing. Uh, so the the customer base that doesn't want to buy from a boneyard, mm-hmm. um, but still wants to buy new equipment. Yep. Right. Um, right. You know that, and I know you guys sell both. So. Yeah, we yep. have the, yeah, we have the new end to use. Yeah. So. Well, and the kicker of it is, like with a lot of the processes, there's several ways to do it, and one way might make sense for you, but it won't make sense for customer X Y Z down the road. There. Right. You know? So there's different processes understanding your business and seeing the way you're doing things helps us to make sure we offer you the proper equipment yeah so. and it yeah. all comes down to relationships i mean we need to be there so that when you do have that issue you'll call us yeah and right. make sure you remember us so that's that's a challenge you know that what well, helps us it's only a two mile drive yeah it so. <laughs> keeps it real convenient <laughs> it does. yeah it really does yeah hey, I'm, you, on my, I'm walking over right now <laughs> You say get your butt over here. Yeah, you know, exactly. I, I can't. I can't say. Well, exactly. it's going to be traffic yeah, issues. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stuck in traffic. Yeah. <laughs> it's two traffic lights between. Yeah, them. that's yeah. right. And they're in Hughesville. Right. <laughs> right. I saw your. Uh, you were in the 
uh, what, what was that woodworking network yesterday? Did you see the uh, about the Wood Pro Expo? You're oh yeah, I did see that. Be yeah. Exhibiting forty species of wood or something. Yeah, or that's what we, we we carry forty species, about forty species. Probably in the course of a year, we sell probably way more than that. But that's not what we stock. And we probably don't stock anywhere near what we used to stock either. Mm. It's just we're so much more conscious of turns. and um, uh, Yeah, so we're going to be down at that. That's, have you done that before, the Wood Pro? Yeah, we have. Yeah, okay. and, and it's worthwhile for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, we go every year. Yeah, I know you guys go too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that It works out for us because that, that that's a good clientele for us to get into. It's down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania here. And, and so we get a good good cross section of people from our delivery territory that are willing to come there and we don't have to go that far to get there either yep. um one thing's probably changed about doing shows is we don't take near the fancy booths and things that we yeah. used to take yeah it's just you know that's not what's important yeah we don't so. do much except pop a couple machines down right and put a couple machines in run maybe well, one or two of them yeah they want but, us to run for that Oh, you guys are going to AWFS, yeah, you, right? Yeah, so, yeah, the truck left uh, this morning. Oh, did it with, really? With your planer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. <Yeah. laughs> well, I won't be able to write you that check. No, yeah, I'll bring it back for you. We'll yeah. Back for you. <laughs> yeah, no, they, uh, load, it's outside. It's dropped down. They're going to leave, I guess, over the weekend sometime mm. and head out that way. But, yeah. yeah, they got it all finished up this week. So, so you know, I was looking through the uh, – uh, exhibitors list um i i was shocked to see that there isn't that many lumber people there at awfs yeah yeah i didn't i didn't look at the list so but there's even some of the big machinery guys aren't going Hmm. so i don't know how how long that show will be um you know hopefully it'll hang on there but the styles pulled out oh did they really i think bsc's out yep um scm actually pulled out but then four of their dealers um, put, are putting machines in the booth that SEM bought. Ah, so it's kind of an interesting. Should see how that. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. And yeah, I don't. I don't know what why that is happening that way. Except that it might be that it's just become too expensive to do the shows in a fashion that they were done years ago. Yeah. And these guys do it in a big way. I mean, yeah, exactly. They all try to outdo the, each other and have a bigger and bigger booth, and it just costs more and more money. Yeah. And and all these show halls are union halls, and right. every, you know you can't you can't even turn a screwdriver without calling over a guy. Right. And, You're not and, supposed to, but yeah. so yeah. it makes it tough. I mean, we went over to Eric and I went to Ligna. Have you ever been over that? No, I, I've never been to Ligna. It was quite a thing. I mean, every yeah. um, all the major booths had like restaurants in them. Wow. Serving alcohol or a bar, serving alcohol. And you could never get away with that over here. Yeah. And they the the cost is so much better over there. They yeah. say it's so much easier to pay for it. And I mean the the, the EMA booth had waiters, bus boys, a wow. full full restaurant right there in in the wow. booth. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yeah. That was it was it was worth going. I'd never been before either cuz I always figured, you know, what I need to go that for, but I'm glad I went, and we'll probably be going again. I'll probably take the rest of the guys, and we we saw some machines we'd like to maybe consider importing. Yeah, that's day, cool. So. Yeah, it's worth what, going. What's, so tell me, what's uh, what's new in the machinery side then? I, I didn't really see anything that earth shattering new over there. There's a lot of this uh, timber stuff. I mean, monstrous four sided planers mm. for the timber. You know, for the the homes that they're making out of timbers and stuff like that now in the timber housing and buildings and so forth and a lot of pellet mills there was one whole building just was like you know pellet mills are huge i've never really seen one yeah. close like that and i just didn't know there were that many it just seemed like you know this booth there's a huge pellet mill with a 200 horsepower motor and then right beside it's another one it was crazy um the big take for us though was turkey the country mm. of turkey is moving into our industry wow and it doesn't matter whether you want to buy a five axis router a double antenna, uh, CNC lathe, uh, packaging machinery, they have it all. Wow. So these were machinery manufacturers out of Turkey? Correct. Wow. Huh. If you walked up to a machine and said, that machine looks great, it looks real, I mean, it looks just like a bocce, let's say. 
but I don't recognize that name. And then you look at it, oh, made in Turkey. How about that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They've been coming on for a while, but we didn't really notice it because we haven't been there before to Ligna. But I understand it's been going on for a couple of years. Hmm. So a couple of them are. Do you see that happening in the States? you see those machines getting start, over here? Starting to, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And mo- most of them that aren't or you know, contacting us regularly now because we showed an interest. They want us to start bringing their machines in. So <laughs> we're thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, is the is the pricing uh, considerably? It's, it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would think you'd have to do that to introduce that into the market here to get people to try it. And yep. Yeah, it's going to have to be a price yeah. thing. Yeah. And, and the quality. And the, a lot of the components are German components. I mean, they were good How electronics. It wasn't like... What you remember back when China and yeah. Taiwan were getting Absolutely. into it. This all looked, uh, we looked at this one lathe and all cast iron <coughs> components, heavy built, the electronics were all German made. It was, it was good looking stuff. I remember uh, being at an IWF show, boy, probably 20 years ago. And uh, uh, so we're, I'm allowed to mention names right oh yeah. Yeah. yeah okay so it was uh you know whining had their couple of their molders out which were big big money always were big money oh yeah great machines yeah well made and um and so there were some chinese knockoffs there you know and i can remember talking to somebody and i was like you know i'm not gonna touch that junk there and he says yeah well you can buy six of them before you get to the same price yeah yeah <laughs> it's like, some people take that oh. attitude some <laughs> people take that yeah i guess you have to know how to hook them up and disconnect them. yeah right <laughs> it's a throwaway mentality yeah some of yeah. that stuff yeah. yeah it's at a customer he was running uh two grizzly sanders and that's strictly what he ran he had two of them sitting in the warehouse and i said well when are we going to step up to a real Sanders? <laughs> that, I can still buy two of these for one of yours. Exactly. Like, All right. Well, we put the first time saver in, ran that for six months, and put the second one in six months later. But hasn't had to replace them. Doesn't have to have one to share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, so that 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 uh, that that thinking changes a little bit when there's like less the uh, activity less with it. Yeah. 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 It's not always tweaking the machine. <laughs> yeah. Fiddling with it. Yeah. Well, and that comes back to the servicing and everything. It's absolutely you, you put your money up front a little yeah. bit further, and you know you're not going to be paying on the tail end right. weekly or being that problem yeah. weekly. Yeah. You know. It's almost like you were saying before we started about your Semco when you thought, yeah, single head you can just run it through twice, right. but maybe the top and bottom would have paid off. Probably would have. I mean, labor. To, to do it today would cost so much more money than when yeah. when, when we'd bought that. Yeah, yeah. You know that that's another important thing too about the maintenance. Uh, and you mentioned that we had just put on maintenance, man. And and so what we did when we made that move was we dedicated him to that position. So that sounds pretty elementary. But when you're doing a fair number of custom work, your workflow goes up and down, up and down like a wave, you know. And so when you have those really high points where you have a lot of stuff out and you're trying to meet your delivery dates and you're two people short. It's easy to. Yeah, just grab that guy (laughs) because he knows how to ride a forklift and operate a planer and do other things, you know. And so. We did that with some other people, and um, over the years, it, it, they end up being essentially production workers. Then, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very difficult one. You have yeah. to almost just dedicate somebody, absolutely. You know, or give them a task that's in the office that's right, not not the same. You know, to right. mean, that they can jump on stuff right away. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. you miss that uh, TPM stuff. The you know the the planned maintenance that you need to do ahead of time. Yep, that's and what that's ends up. Exactly. That's what ends up falling away. Yeah, and right. that boy, that ends up getting you in the in the back. Yeah. Well, that's one thing that we do push is, you know, it's it's hard to get people over that hump to do a regular Preventive. maintenance. You know, let's schedule it in every three months, every six months. Yeah. You know, and and then we have a listing of the equipment that we can go through and say, okay, yeah, we're. And uh, it's important because a lot of times we'll catch things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, before it's catastrophic. Yeah, you know, not a lot of people doing that. We, do you know, uh, North Hudson Woodcraft up there, Jeff Slifka. Yeah, I know of them. We don't, we don't do any business with them. But yeah, you know, he yeah. he had our guys come up and evaluate all of his equipment. Wow. And then we went in and did a PM, and now it's a regular. I think six months or whatever. They go back and do that for him. So neat. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, big thing. I mean, if you get ahead of it, you're not going to have downtime. Right. I mean, if you regularly maintain and keep up with your PM schedules, right, that's more uptime, more money in your pocket. Sure. Yeah. So, not a lot yeah. of people think that way. That's no. Well, and trying to find the people that can do that is another yeah, story to exactly. that. So, yeah, that is certainly uh, a very different thing. You know, I'll tell you another thing that helped with that. Um, I told you that uh, Dominic didn't have any formal training or anything, but we did put him through a, an apprenticeship program. Oh yeah, um, and uh, so that was with Penn College. Okay, hmm. that worked out pretty neat, um, and it's quite elementary. I mean, from the aspect that if hey, if you were already doing electrical work and you had to sit through this stuff, maybe that'd be boring to you. But it also talked about PLCs and talked about hydraulics and some of the things that he had absolutely no experience in. Yeah, and so that ended up being a, a really nice, nice thing. They like that Megatronic, or what they call? Yeah, Megatronic. Megatronic, I think, is what. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Was that a regular course or like a night course? Uh, that was a um, maybe an eighteen month kind of thing. Mm. Um, that he did on on the side. Well, I mean, you know, he still was working. So yeah, so that was designed originally so that you would. I mean, you're going to pay the employee. Uh, then they're going to hop in a car and drive up, in our case, to Williamsport, a 20-mile drive, and then sit in, in a classroom for, for four hours. And so you're paying them for that. Yeah. Well, then COVID hit. Mm. And so then it went remote, and which was fine by us. I was going to say, because, that might have been yeah. better for yeah. you. So we set him up in an office and gave him a computer and, and the book, and he just worked there, and he did great. And and I proctored the exams. Mm. Um, oh, wow. So it, it really worked out quite well. Yeah, um, good. I, I mean, I, not that I'm, I'm not glad that COVID made us yeah, do that, right, but it, right. but it did it did help us out a lot, and made that that part of it pretty nice. And we had another young guy that we put through the uh, that uh, program too, and um, and he did really well with it too. Huh. But that's yeah. how it worked out for us. Yeah, when when you have a much better understanding of all the different yeah items that go into it it makes it that much easier for somebody right so i think that 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 probably is and because it's also i think subsidized by the state because it is it, they're trying to promote the the apprenticeship programs mm. uh it it ends up being a oh a, was that through pa wednet yeah it's well for manufacturing well part of it i got to pa wednet but the other okay. part was done through i'm guessing a department of education at pennsylvania has an apprenticeship program, and they actually PMF Industries up in Williamsport does it for, I think CNC stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Hmm. Um, so this was basically what we thought about doing was putting some of our uh, younger guys that we think have uh, an aptitude to run molders and things through that, so that they kind of get an inkling of. Uh, being able to fix and tinker with things that might not quite be right. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, the, the, there's nobody that teaches molder operation anymore. That, yeah. that, that schooling is gone. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The PA Wednet is a really nice, yeah. especially for, you know, all the industrial training and stuff that right. you can, you know, most people don't realize what it is. It's for manufacturers in Pennsylvania. Right. And uh, anybody can apply that's a manufacturer and, and basically, they do it at schools like over there, Penn Tech, or well, what they do is once you apply for the money online, um, like our industrial training guy, Cemento, Tony Cemento, um, that's how oh, yeah. you know he he is paid coming in for that kind of stuff as well. But you can send people to school, and yeah, whatever. Can... So you you get allocated so much money depending on your employees mm. that you have, and then you get to you don't actually I don't think you get the money directly, do they now? Or no, I think they, you pay you pay the pay it and then it's pay the cost and then put in for the reimbursement and they yeah. you get your money back mm. from them. But it's it's a great resource that I don't think a lot of manufacturing guys take advantage of, and you know it's a great way to bring in for you know your OSHA mandate training and yeah, right. you know forklift training and uh, just different things like that, and then it it opens it up that you can send them to any of the community college type of things or anything that's a training program that that uh, will help your employees. Yeah, you know, they've expanded it uh, quite a bit to take in even some sales training now. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they didn't used to do that, but huh. but that's opened up now. That's been a huge help yeah here's a good uh 
application for that. So our accounting software has all the different things that you can take, you know, courses on their own stuff, right? Well, you can apply for that to be paid for. So, hmm. I mean, you know, maybe it's 45 bucks to take this right. little course remotely as you're sitting at your desk and whatever, but um, even even things like that, though, uh, would uh, you can apply for. That's interesting. Yeah, so they you have to apply for it. They have they approve it, and uh, based on who you are, and and I and I also think that uh, uh, you it's like two years in a row you can apply, and then the third you got to take a year off or something before you can come back in. But yeah, I think what we used to do is always we applied every year, and then you got different allocations. You right. know, so if there was money left over you were actually like second string type of deal. Oh. Right. And you, you could might still get picked. Like yeah. That. So, you know, it might be, so we, every year we used to just put in for it because it was, it was great. We used to, to do yeah. all types of different stuff. Yeah. I mean, one year we were changing our whole CAD engine in our system and, you know, we sent like six guys to yeah. Alpha, you know, AutoCAD and, you know, it, it made it nice because you get them away from the shop, you right. know, which is, which is a nice deal as well. Or like you said, you right. Locked him in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> the lock was on the outside. Lock. It's only like that when the air conditioner doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice to get to give that uh, that kind of employee an opportunity to get out of the yeah. shop too. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah that, that's been we, we've uh, we've tapped into that. That's been quite helpful. You know, another area that we did that with was uh, lumber grading too. Um, sometimes, oh no, kidding! Yeah, sometimes oh, lumber wow. grading schools will uh, qualify for that too. So, mm. or short the short programs, the short the short training. So it's a week long training. Um, now it's only I don't think it covers travel expenses, but I think it covers the cost of the curriculum. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it hard to get people to do that to do grading? Um. Yeah, probably because it's such a foreign concept um it's not a computer screen yeah you know if you tell somebody hey uh we're looking for a lumber grader um okay well that's somebody else not me i guess um the interesting part about that for our business is we don't really have to meet the national hardwood lumber association grade rules on a customer side because the customer is mandated even tougher specifications. Mm. Right, mm. right. They don't care about all the grade rules and everything. They just want clear. <laughs> yeah. You know, or cherry, all red. Or uh, <laughs> walnut, all black, no sapwood. Um, so um, from the selling standpoint, it's not as critical. However, from the purchasing standpoint, it's probably very critical. Because there is still a standard that is the only recognized grade standard. I'm going to say maybe globally, from the aspect of hardwoods, but remember, North American hardwoods probably are the most uh, well managed and sustainable, and uh, probably have the best uh, name of uh, hardwoods mm -hmm. that way. Yep. So the NHLA grading standards. Um, certainly have a, a mark still there. And so on the purchasing side, sometimes it's good to have somebody that knows the grade rules. Yep. Now, some of us have been around long enough to look at a bunch of boards going across the chain and say, uh, that doesn't look too good. <laughs> or, boy, that really looks sharp. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, when we get into situations like that, uh, generally, uh, we'll have a discussion with the mill, but that you know we don't seem to have the, that many problems anymore. That's good. Yep. I think that in the larger mills, some of those guys are using scanners and other yeah. other uh, the large ones systems. Are. Yeah. yeah. So um, there, you know, I don't think that there's that much built into cheating, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> because it's pretty easy to catch and see. Yeah, you know? you're not going to get away with it yeah. too often yeah. anymore. Yeah. So counting lumber is a similar issue. Um, so we're actually using a, a handheld on a phone or a tablet that takes a picture of a, of an end of a pack, and so in a matter of seconds, then you have the board footage. Um, really? And and I saw uh, that I saw that app. I didn't I didn't know yeah. it really worked. Oh yeah, it works great. No kidding. Um, hmm. 
very, very, very effective for customers because you can show them, I can send them, hey, tell me which pack you want. You know, here's, here's, here's all the widths and, and everything in it. And, mm. Uh, mm. and they're looking at the pack. Oh, yeah, give me that pack right there. So that's been really nice. Um, what we find is that there's enough of this kind of technology out there that uh, just about everybody's got some some kind of an electronic tally system going. And so the counts are pretty stable Actually, and good yeah. anymore. Um, okay. So that, that's, been, that's been really nice. Um, uh, that's a cloud-based system. And... Uh, it took me a while to get used to wanting to use a cloud-based yeah, system. Yeah. You know, yeah. all the horror stories of, oh, don't do that, and you know the Russians will have, have a rim <laughs> <inventory. laughs> you know, so, you you have. <laughs> yeah. So if the Russians want a inventory, I'll be happy to sell it to them. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in stock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell so, us a little about your uh, exotics. Yeah, you used to bring wood in that we used to unload here for you. Yeah, that was um, – okay, so so that was uh, Red Grandis. That that was uh, – um, uh, it's a eucalyptus uh, family product. It's, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a hybrid. Mm. Um, so it, you don't do that anymore? Well, we don't bring it in directly anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've got some arrangements with some other people that do buy it indirectly, and uh, – there's some reasons for that. We, the we we probably weren't selling enough of it to meet turns because it it was a, a product that that uh, us and uh, I don't know maybe a handful of others were were trying to promote uh, to to probably compete a little bit with some of the, like African mahoganies and and right. uh, and Sapili and things. Sapili kind of took that over. Um, the Red Grandis is a great product uh, from the aspect that it it it's it's not as dense, so it's not as heavy. Um, it doesn't have the red red color that you see in Sapili's and African mahogany, but it probably has a rose color hue to it that's similar to a lighter African. Hmm. Probably way more stable than that than the African. Um, so we have some other exotics too. Uh, so we, so many of them are uh, on the watch lists for CITES stuff. So we got out of being a direct importer uh, mainly because of that. I just didn't want to make us liable mm -hmm. uh, on an environmental kind of aspect of dealing with some. No, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So we, we buy from uh, other, other uh, importers that, uh, who are the importers of record and we make sure we get a Lacey Act compliance from them to make sure that, that it's from, yeah. from uh, legal logging. Um, but we sell, uh, we'll, we'll sell teak. We'll sell um, uh, some of the mahoganies. That are available. So we sell. We do sell a lot of a sapili. That that's probably far and away the largest. It's probably the most uh, dense. Yeah. In abundance. Yeah. And of the and consistent. Series. Yeah, and consistent and clear and always the same color and. Hmm. Yeah, it's really. It, How it, about like the lace like woods? Do you get you get much? Yeah, we have we have a little lace wood. Lace wood's kind of hard to get, uh, but sometimes you got to wait probably several months. To be able to see it, yeah, those kinds of woods we basically they sell better in the store actually than they do oh, wholesale yeah. wise. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's one that you have to look at. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and a lot of people don't realize lace wood. It's yeah, really, really pretty. It's powerful. got that rice crispy look to yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and done finished well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looks huh. really good. Yeah, so we have some purple heart. Uh, Yellow Heart, I think, was added to the CITES list, so uh, not too sure that we we might have some that we we uh, probably had before it was put on the CITES <laughs> list, but still um, allowed to sell it. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, you don't want to get the Yellow Heart virus. That's right. Uh, <laughs> you know, things like um, Paduk and um, uh, Bubinga uh, would have been probably the typical exotic woods that people from years ago would have recognized and yeah uh we have some zebra wood we uh 
and and it's fascinating. Some of the people who still come in and buy buy those exotics because that's all they want are the exotics. What do they use it for? Furniture? Or yeah, furniture. Or? Uh, uh, gosh, uh, like a like probably small knickknack kind of thing. Maybe jewelry box. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. it, some guys doing some inlay work and. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. we've had, uh, some people buy purple heart and purple heart's an interesting wood. When you're first playing it, it has almost a gray hue to it. And then as it, it gets uh, that dark purple color really quick. Hmm. Um, we actually have some of that showing online. It's, it's interesting because, because, uh, it almost looks fake. And it doesn't look like real wood. It, mm -hmm. It's it's that purple. Now, hmm. when you play it, um, you say it turns really quick. Is that like within 10, 15 minutes, like 24 hours a week? Yeah, I would say probably within even an hour, you would see some changes. Wow. wow. Probably the next day, you'd see the most changes. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. So we're something like cherry, when you plain cherry up fresh, this is an in interesting story. So I spent 11 years uh, at, at, at Rex Lumber first. And uh, so Rex Lumber had a, the way they would buy lumber would be they'd buy it green, they'd air dry it, and then they would kiln dry it. Well, when you air dry and then kiln dry cherry in that time frame, it has time to oxidize. And anybody that buys cherry knows that it turns red, redder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so most of the cherry that we were, that I was used to selling from sawmills that were up in this part of the state was really red. And so when I came on with the Lewis's and we started to sell some cherry and I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is awesome. Here's a sawmill with mm -hmm. all this cherry. It looked like, and I would send it out and people would plane it up and they'd say, it's not red. What's wrong with your cherry? <laughs> I don't know. What do you mean? Well, it's just fresh. You know, it's it. what we do, what Mark does at the sawmill is he saws for the kiln schedule. So there's no air dry time. Mm -hmm. it just goes right in it takes a little bit longer to dry it and and but he he just feels more conf confident in the quality that comes out that way so we had to get over that for uh, <laughs> for a couple of years but uh it it's it it'll turn just as red uh with with time yeah okay yeah. pretty yeah very pretty mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes i've noticed uh i have some cherry and some walnut that gets some direct sunlight. I mean, really direct sunlight, like windowsill kind of stuff every day. Probably after about 10 years, it does start to bleach out a little bit. Okay. Mm. So UVs you know, are definitely affecting that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, you'd think cherry would just get redder and redder and redder and really turn dark red. Well, eventually it's going to bleach. Hmm. It's gonna, it's gonna wash out yeah. unless you've got something on it that's UV keep protected. It, yeah, UV yeah. Protected. keep the UV out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and the problem is a lot of these coatings today too are don't last long in the in right. UV. What they're claiming and what you actually get, especially when you're putting it on exotics, that uh, for some reason it just wants there's with the new chemicals, it's just not reacting like right. it used to in direct sunlight. Yeah, a lot of water-based stuff that doesn't have the same. <laughs> yeah, it's just not a biting in, Yeah, you know. Yeah. Did you do anything with the thermally modified wood? We did. We did. Um, <clears throat> we uh, we got into it pretty heavy for a while in yellow pine and tried to go with the decking. Um, and uh, we're out of that. Oh. Um, probably for a couple of reasons. Uh, again, that was a... Trying to sell that would have been selling it to a different kind of customer base that we weren't used to. So it would have had to go to the retail lumber yard or the the big box units that would sell decking and things like that. And and uh, the, the science behind it is not – on domestic woods really wasn't proven out yet. Okay. Um, I think that it's it's a pretty nice product today. Um, I've seen it in uh, I think Binghamans do it in in red oak and uh, poplar and ash and no, soft maple maybe poplar and ash. Yeah, I know that. I'm not sure about and uh, and it's a pretty nice product for them. Now there's probably levels to which you are putting it in the chamber, and so when we were doing this with yellow pine, we were dealing with a company out in Indiana, and and we would put it, it would go into a chamber for, I don't know, 24 hours. 
And so the, the premise of thermally modified wood is you put it into a chamber uh, with the lack of oxygen, not a vacuum, but the lack of introduction to oxygen, and then you ramp that temperature up quick. So you're going from you know, ambient room temperature to 425 degrees Fahrenheit mm. um, wow. really fast. And so the onset of fire is there if, you, if you're dealing with a, not an airtight kind of container. Right, because you're going to get a convection. Absolutely, and you're, yeah. going to, you're, going to, you're going to ignite that stuff. Right. So what happens then in that 24 hours is, is that you're cooking, essentially cooking out all the organics, uh, which are what bugs eat. And, um, and in the case of, uh, I know in the case of poplar, uh, it, it does reduce the strength too because you're collapsing, the cells collapse. And uh, so the collapsing of the cells is really what makes it impervious to water. And so that's the theory as to why some of it's pretty good outdoors. Mm. Oh, the um, poplar side. Of. Yeah, the poplar side. But, but I think all the sides. We had only done the testing. I did some testing with uh, Penn State when we got into this originally. And uh, so we were only testing, I think, poplar at that point in time. I'd done some color tests um, with all the species to see if uh, what, what happened in the oxidation process. And... Um, so if you anybody that buys wood and just sticks it outside would notice the weathering that happens, regardless of what the species is. You know, it t gets that silver patina, right? right. Yep. So what we found with the thermally modified wood was it gets that silver patina much quicker. That happens yeah. much faster. Mm, really? Hmm. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that it needs something to protect it. If, that, if you want it to look like the way it, it did originally, yeah, you better put something on it. But yeah. if... If you don't mind that it's going to go silver patina, which works great on my deck that I have at my house, but my wife doesn't like the silver patina. <laughs> so, so you got to get out the uh, yeah. I got to get out the brush. stuff and uh, <laughs> treat it every Seal other it year up. or whatever. Right? <laughs> but but um, so so basically now what we do is um, we treat it kind of as a specification wood, and uh, so the only thing we're stocking is four quarter, one inch thick. Thermally modified poplar. Okay. We're not stocking anything else. Hmm. Okay. Um, the, the, the European market has been open way more to thermally modified woods than the U.S. market. Um, there's some legal stuff that has a lot to do with that. So you can't, on a commercial building, you've got to have engineering documentation of strength properties and there's no way this stuff is going to pass those strengths hmm. um, so there there probably is if you are putting your uh, let's say you're 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 building a deck and you want to put your your uh, uh, joices every every uh, say 12 inches instead of 24 inches right well that would certainly pass but because there's no documentation that says that's what you should do you can't get that done commercially because the building engineers or the city engineer or whoever is not going to sign off yeah yeah it's not like in right. the old days when you know you'd build with hemlock and you, the Absolutely. term was you build heavy right and that was bringing everything right. together exactly and thicker hmm. and and uh it, it's actually a great wood. It is for, a great wood, but it, and a lot of people don't not, use it because it yeah, doesn't. It's have not, it. It's not in the IBC, the International yeah. Building Code, because it's it's not grade stamped. Yeah, so hmm. you can't even use it. So hemlock that grows, which is the state tree here in Pennsylvania, which grows everywhere, right? Yep. Um, and so you have a lot of small little family sawmills that sawed up. They technically are not allowed to sell that into home construction because it doesn't. It's not grade stamped. Hmm. Yeah, I used it for decking, and uh, did you it, doing it as a two inch thick and <coughs> decorative edge, yeah. and, and uh, up in the, up in the Potter County area, so mm. it held up really well to no uh, stains or anything on it, which is um, pretty amazing. Most people don't realize that yeah. you can you can do not, that. Not mm. like treated yellow pine that dries out and curls up. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Really? Is that, so all, the, all, all, the, all the yellow pine people out there saying, don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Bite your tongue. Yeah. Well, it's one of those overlooked woods 
that I think can do, be really nice for a project, if uh, but you can't th- really technically throw it into a structural. Mm. Yeah, you can use it in uh, pole buildings. Yeah, uh, yep. and and barn construction still that's still legal. Mm. So, hmm. um, yeah, because a lot of the, a lot of the exterior barns and stuff were were used with the hemlock, hemlock yeah, on the outside. Yeah, and right. the one we tore down was hemlock. Yeah, the yeah. barn that we had next right. door here. Right. Hmm. Yeah, hemlock has a natural. Uh, it's it's nat, nat, bugs are naturally resistant to hemlock, so oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's why it's got probably a natural. I, I don't know if it's cyanide or something, some kind of poison Off gas of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So uh, the bugs don't like to eat it too much. Yeah. Makes a for a good fire outside. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <it does>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've been talking about an hour and a half here. Yeah, so, great, uh, awesome. I, I really enjoyed it. I'm glad you came down. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. This has been neat. Yeah, yep. Keith, this was fantastic. You yeah. made, made our great first guest coming out of the, uh, that's cool. out of well, the gates. And yeah. we'll have to get you back on and we can I'd love to so, come back at any time. Come, and come back when we know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Slowly getting there. Well, I, yeah. I am getting older, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait too long. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Next Tuesday works for you then. We, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, we'll set a date for season two, episode two, so we can do it annually. Cool. How's awesome. that? That'd be great. <laughs> Tell Jill. She will remember. That's she right. Will That's right. Yeah, we'd love to do that. <laughs> love to do that. It'd be great. Good. All right. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Yep. yep. Well, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Till the next episode. Over and out. Cool. Hey, everyone. One quick thing before you go. Uh, we're going to put the link to uh, Lewis Lumber's website and their e commerce page in the description, as well as the WedNet PA info. We're going to add that link in the description as well. Don't forget to join us next time and thanks for tuning in.